for that. Thank you for coming. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do this um, together until about 4 o'clock and in front of the camera. Uh, so as promised, Peter Pomerantsev is, is here. If for those of you who heard the keynote speech that he gave, um, Peter Pomerantsev is, is originally from Kiev and um, lives in DC. Uh, and he has a number of, of very, very interesting books. So. Um, including his first book, a memoir called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, Adventures in Modern Russia, published in 2015, um, and has been translated into a dozen languages. Um, this is not propaganda, right? The second book, which is all about propaganda. We'll call it disinformation, misinformation. And the new book, which I, I think is really fascinating, uh, which I just started reading and we'll ask him some questions about. It is called How to Win an Information War, the Propaganda Who Outwitted Hitler. Uh, and this is just released, published by uh, Public Affairs in 2024. So let me just start with a question for Peter about the nature of propaganda and truth. So could you talk a little bit about post-truth as you've defined it, and what drew you into the story? Sure, I mean, look, post-truth is a, is a quite horribly overused term. Um, but, but I found the, the, sort of the context of it interesting in, in the recent debates about people like Putin and, and American presidents and many others, that these were leaders who, who weren't so much lying as they didn't care about the truth, and actually they enjoyed throwing the truth out of the window. Um, there was an act of sort of rebelliousness in that that appealed to people for many reasons. And um, in my first book, I, I kind of like, actually accidentally misquoted Hannah Arendt uh, with her great line that under the Nazis, um, um, everything was possible and nothing was true. Um, and. So this is something that's happened before. You know, these societies where people have given up on truth um, through a mixture of maybe exhaustion, but also because they don't want to live in the truth. Um, that's been around before. And people have been thinking about how to engage people who've chosen not to care about the truth anymore. They've thought about it before. We despair a lot about it now. How can you reach audiences and their post-truth echo chamber, how do you engage them? Can you, one tries, gives up, often it's tragic. I mean, during the recent um, invasion of Ukraine, Ukrainians were sort of phoning their relatives in Russia, saying we're being bombed and their relatives would deny it. So this is, we've been here before. You know, Hannah Arendt is talking about the 1930s, about Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union um, and I discovered this character who, who basically spent the Second World War trying to do exactly this, trying to break through the Nazi echo chamber and trying to engage audiences in Germany during the war. And there was so much in his experience with Echoed with Today's. He despaired of the way pro-democracy media um, preached to Germans. Um, or thought they could fact check their way out of propaganda um, or deliver worthy lectures about how democracy dies in darkness or whatever. He, he, felt, he thought that would never work. Um, and he thought you need to try something completely different. So he, here we have a story. Let, let's name your character. Who is your character, first of all? What is his name? My, my character's name is Sefton Delma. Okay. So let, let's talk about what he knows. Let's examine his horizon, his epistemology. What, what sort of things did he read? What, what was in his library? Ooh, what a brilliant question. Um, so his father was a professor of English literature in Berlin University. So he grows up, I think, you know, with a lot of books. Um, but he's a British child, British Australian child, in Berlin in the First World War. His father actually has him learn German first. He's a real stickler for understanding the culture you live in, which is a very important lesson for later. 
So he would have had a lot of German books as well. Um, he then goes back to Germany after university in England, and he's in the cabaret scene of 1920s Germany. He's a journalist, but he's in this incredible artistic moment with very famous dramatists like, I don't know, like Bertolt Brecht, with, you know, the, um, you know, some of the most, you know, the architectural and artistic um, developments of, of the Bauhaus group. Um, so he would have been, he was part of that world. Um, his wife was actually, his first wife was a, an avant-garde artist who was very close, possibly in a relationship with Giacometti, was painted by Picasso. Um, his parties in Berlin and then Paris had this incredible mix of spies, politicians, and some of the greatest artists of their day. So he's, he's someone who's, he would have had, I think, a lot of politics on his shelves as well. I mean, he's, he's a journalist covering current affairs. So, so one, one leg in avant-garde art and one leg in politics. I, I see this as a really interesting parallel, Peter, in, in your earlier writing and in your first book. So one of the things that came to mind was thinking about Delmer in the 1920s in Berlin and, and your life and your memoir as a filmmaker in the 2000s. I don't know if this is a legitimate comparison, but I was just thinking of, of all of the resources that you used in order to capture that transition into the 1930s. So let, let's look at it through Delmer's eyes, and, and maybe we can use a projection screen and look at, look at it through your eyes. How, how does your main protagonist begin to make this transition into the, into the 30s? What is, what is he watching around him? So he's watching, firstly, a society where people don't know who they are anymore, huge social, economic, technological changes in, in Germany, huge financial crashes, and where the cabaret, which is the sort of the most popular entertainment and art form of the day, really expresses this crisis in society. People are putting on different roles, um, trying out new gender roles. This is a time when like, you know, you could see that this is the first sort of early version of the trans movement is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, new national roles, new social roles, and streaming into the cities from the countryside, reinventing themselves. And, and an artistic scene as well that, 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 that reflects that, his favorite and most important theater director who he refers to quite often in his memoirs, is a guy called Max Reinhardt, who saw all of life as theater, who was revolutionizing theater in many ways, but most spectacularly was kind of staging plays inside the city. So he'd stage plays inside cathedrals, inside train stations, mm -hmm. these vast sort of spectacles that were, were really undermining the border between art and life and performance and life. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll read a passage from um, How to Win an Information War that really struck me when you're describing this dramaturgy. And, and I think in many ways your, your, your book is, is set as a screenplay ordered for film. Um, a, per a particular passage I like, so Peter writes, one place where Sefton felt safe and secure was in the wine-red soft seats in the stalls of the Deutsches Theater, watching the shows of the director, Max Reinhardt, and his dramaturge, Arthur Kahane. Kahane's son, Peter, was Delmer's best friend at school and would get him the exclusive tickets. Reinhardt and Kahane were already famous. They had started out with a cabaret, Schall und Rauch, all through the night in a tiny studio, they'd put on sketches that taunted the era's famous stars, poking fun at the way these actors tried to be quote unquote natural with their brooding sighs and pained expressions satirizing the different acting fads popular on the Berlin stage, pointing out the artifice in each. Reinhardt didn't believe in forcing a style of acting on his troupe as Martin Esslin, one of his students and a later theater critic, described, quote, Reinhardt was convinced that in most people and most actors, the real personality, I love this, is buried deep inside under a thick layer of shyness, mannerisms, and convention. And I, I wanted to ask, unquote, so I wanted to ask you, um, Peter, if you could pick out a kind of personality for the information 
warrior, the future information warrior, or maybe even like a kind of psychocognitive hacker, what, what, are the qual what are the qualities of such a, such a person? We, we talk a lot about journalism and information warriors nowadays, but what, what, what are the qualities, the man with qualities here for your, for your protagonist? So, so I'm very glad that you landed on that passage, which goes on a little bit. Um, because in all my books, I always put in like a little passage or a little bit of where the actual heart of the book is. But I always play this game where I don't then highlight it. And actually, I've had people complain, going, why doesn't Pomerantz say what the book is about? I'm like, it's there. It's, it's suspense. It's we there. Need it. it's, and it's the light books, which sort of go, and the conclusion is. Um, which maybe I should change and start doing that. But that's actually the secret passage in the book, which is the heart of the book, which, which is just dropped in there. I mean, it's part of the story. I mean, I hope it doesn't feel unnatural. But actually, I'm, it's amazing you went for that passage because, you know, that is actually the, the heart of the book in that passage there. When I found it, I found it very, very late. This quote from Martin Eslin, who's a very, very famous theater critic, defined the theater of the absurd in the sort of, in the sort of 60s and 70s. But he was an actor with Reinhardt. Um, so Reinhardt's idea, which is Delma's idea, which I think is probably my idea as well, but I think it's all of our ideas in the social media age, is that there's no true you. There's no like, you're always acting. Language, being someone, interacting, is always performing. Language is already giving you roles and social codes and behaviors to perform. It's unavoidable. The moment you say I or you, you're already in a role. And that's fine. That's just the reality of living inside language and living inside societies. The difference is, do you populate the roles created by others and miss yourself? Now, Delma's theory of propaganda, to the extent he had a theory, is that what propaganda does is give you roles to play in life, especially when you're confused, and especially when these roles allow you to articulate the most evil parts of your personality. So that's what the Nazis did. They allowed you to play SS men, Aryans, Volksgenosse, and those were roles that were satisfying, but where you were weirdly passive, you were giving yourself up to Goebbels, who was directing the whole pageant. And Delma's answer, and Esselin's answer, and Reinhardt's answer is this is fascinating instruction that Reinhardt gives his actors. It's actually quite revolutionary. He tells his actors, when, you're, when you, Stephen, want to play Peter, don't imitate Peter which is what a good actor does. He goes and studies his subject and imitates it. It's like, no, don't do that. Zelensky does that very well. <laughs> so actually, we can, we can mm, it's interesting, really interesting. <laughs> um, and he'd, he would say, no, Stephen, you've got to find things in yourself that would animate the role of Peter. Yeah? You create a role by finding things in yourself and pouring yourself into it. So the role comes alive in the interaction between the script and you. It's a co-creation. Look, I think we have this all the time on social media. You know, mm -hmm. we now, what, what Delmer is trying to describe, what, what it captures, is now happening to us all every day, because we're constantly performing ourselves on social media. The irony is we often think we're being very ourselves on social media, but any big data set will tell you people are saying the same things in a snowball effect, repeating each other. Maybe at that moment, each one thinks he's unique, but actually, you're imitating the poses, the phrases, the language, the emoticons to make it really simple, the masks, literally, of everybody else in a group in order to fit in with that group. And Delma would say that the battle against propaganda is undermining those roles that have been bequeathed to you by propagandists and learning to, and I love this, it's a very English phrase, act yourself, to sort of perform your own roles in life. And we face that every time we go online. Are we gonna imitate or are we gonna play ourselves on social media? Because you're always playing yourself. You're always playing on social media, but are you gonna find some way to do it which brings more of you to the role? Yeah, I, I, I love that answer. And since you mentioned Goebbels, I, I, I wanted in many ways to, to kind of flash forward into the Third Reich and to think about television, film, radio, all the dimensions of, of media because we have new language in, in the Gen Z world. We talk about threat casting or AI or, or whatever kind of new, new thing for the year or new thing for the, for the month or the day. 
And, and yet, you're back in this period really from the 20s to the 40s, and it, it, is, a, it is a period of, of spectacular mass media deception and lying, and so your protagonist has, has a particular attitude toward Goebbels, and tell us what that is. What, what does he learn about the way Goebbels functions? And then the next question is, how does this matter for Russia and Ukraine? So we'll, we'll anticipate that. What does he find out about Goebbels and Nazi propaganda? So, Sefton Delma is, I think, one of two people that I've come across, and I'm sure the sort of historians uh, who are watching this will, will find other examples that, that I came across, which said something absolutely fascinating to me but then which makes total sense. Now, a lot of people have pointed out that Hitler was acting. You know, we have all these famous photographs of Hitler acting Hitler, you know, that when he's doing these different poses. I'm not going to do Hitler poses. You might get down Chaplin can do it for us. Yes, exactly. But, so we've always known that. Even though Goebbels would claim, like today's populists, that when he literally wrote this, I'm misquoting, but literally misquoting, you know, there is nothing ever of artifice around Hitler. He is pure nature. He is the genuine. He's so, he's so real. You know, he might not be nice, but he's real. And and Delma, like many others, points out that this is nonsense. That this is a role Hitler plays. He travels with Hitler on his airplane tours mm -hmm. in 1928, around these famous airplane tours, tours to hysterical rallies. And and he points out how Hitler looks like a tra tired traveling salesman one moment, <laughs> eating yes. an egg. Yes. Completely blank, and then the crowd appears, and he suddenly plays these roles, which every German recognizes from, from German history, actually. But Delma then that says something else. The crowd is, on the one hand, which is what the Nazis wanted, sort of almost hypnotized. And that was the Nazis' aim. They believed in various ideas around hypnotism. But when Delma looks closer at the crowd, he thinks that acting as well. They're kind of performing rapture. The other person who says this is Theodore Adorno, who's a, who looks like Delma physically, actually. There's a little bit of an echo there. If you think about it. Yeah, yeah. But, but, if, but, but if Delma is, is, is kind of a, you know, he's writing for the Daily Express, he's, he's definitely not a Marxist. Um, he's sort of a British conservative, essentially. Adorno is a Marxist critic of the time, but they but Dorna says something very similar. He says that the Nazi rapturous hypnotized crowd is performing this. There's a level at which they're acting. And when I read this, first in Delmer and then in Adorno, I was like, what? I hadn't heard that before. I'm sure that other people have noted this. But I hadn't read it before, because we do think of the crowd as in a sort of you know, orgy of the unconscious or whatever. Um, what it reminded me most of, I used to go to a lot of raves when I was a student. And when you rave, you, you're meant to be at one in a hypnotized moment with the music. But we were always performing it, even in quite intense moments of this process. You're always slightly acting it. And that's Delma's great insight. He says, OK, if they're slightly acting it, they can also act something else. You know, this is not the only thing these people can be. And his propaganda is all about, OK, here is the performance that Goebbels has given you, including this you know, ecstatic performance almost. But here are the other things and roles that you can play and enjoy, and which might be in your interest as opposed to Goebbels' interest. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's this Dionysian element that, that you, you really catch well in the book. And it, it, it takes us in many ways, Peter, beyond this old and maybe stale discussion of living in truth or truth versus post-truth. And, and I found it really interesting that your theorists are not, let's say, Adorno or Hannah Arendt, but Jacques Ellul, who, who's, I think, really interesting in writing about propaganda for the post-war years. Um, I do want to ask you how you weave in the full-scale war story. So on the one hand, we, we do have this, let's call it a pre-Nuremberg, story of propaganda and Nazi society. You use a lot of Richard Evans, the historian. 
in talking about the history of the Third Reich. And, and yet, we also have this very personal, almost journalistic account of the first few months of the full-scale war, not the entire war since 2014, but the full-scale war since February 2022. So what, what kind of story do you want your readers and, and the audience here to know about those first few months of the war, and, and then like the corollary to this is, how does it pertain to your protagonist, Delmar? What's, what's, the, what's the leap there? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's worth just, I was literally writing this book in that, when the war started, I started going to Ukraine even more. I used to go a lot, but I started going almost every month. And um, um, actually, as I traveled, I'd have a, a, a large cabin bag, I think would be the right uh, description, full of <laughs> the books that I needed to finish the book. Because even though a lot of the book had been written before the full-scale invasion, mm. you know, the last phase is actually the one that you sort of like, you're checking everything and rewriting. It's the most busy phase in a way. And I was doing that during the trip, so I was literally dragging Delma's memoirs, <laughs> the memoirs of his... Of his uh, Black Boomerang? And, yeah, yeah, so, co-conspirators, yeah. many more. Um, also, wonderful books by Chris and Speyer, who are two 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 culturologists um, who, at the New School, um, analyzed and transcribed sort of a daily record of Nazi propaganda in the war. See, these are all out of print books. You can't get them on your Kindle. I had a lot on my Kindle as well, but a lot I had to take. Like, the best ones are out of print, and I had to drag them around. Um, so it's absolutely bizarre, sort of for months, just coming to Kiev with this with this suitcase of Delmer and Nazi. Um, Nazi propaganda analysis. Um, and I say that, A, because I didn't want to get it off my chest, but B, because um, I was constantly looking to these books to try to, for some sort of inspiration, lessons, positive and negative, about how to help Ukraine in the war. And part of helping Ukraine in the war is, is undermining the efficacy of, of the Russian war machine, which is also a human war machine, which is also soldiers and bureaucrats and all sorts of people who make that war machine happen. Um, that's how Delma framed his challenge. He wasn't trying to inspire a democratic rebellion in Germany. He thought it was too late for that. Right. His aim was to like, what is the role of information to undermine the Nazi war machine and the bond between the Nazi leadership and the people? Um, and I think in the first weeks of the war, um, I was in, I was actually doing an interview with Zelensky, um, the Atlantic magazine were interviewing him and I came along. I remember that. Yeah. I, I want you to talk about that. Can, can you say a few words about that? Yeah. How well, you work, how you work in Zelensky and your experience. So sure. So that was right at the start of the war. And, and one of the things that the, the Zelensky talked about in the interview was was how he was trying to communicate with the Russian people. I mean, he'd spent a lot of time working in Russia as an entertainer, as a sort of cabaret artist, because, you know... He was in Moscow, right? Yeah, yeah. He, well, as, and then the comedy sketch shows he does are a form of cabaret. He was part of the Moscow cabaret. Um, and, and he was calling his friends. He was making this video appeals to Russians. And, and, and the term he used was he felt that they were in a, in a, in a bunker. He meant both psychological and... I mean, actually more psychological than, than technical. And he couldn't get through to them. All his emotional appeals, all his appeals to don't, you know, kill our citizens, you know, we're meant to be close countries, what are you doing? All of that was hitting deaf ears. And his private appeals were as well to people. And he was like, how the hell do we get through to them? Um, he tied it actually to the idea of responsibility. He said that what Russians were doing was they didn't want to take responsibility for what was happening. And that was one of the reasons they were pushing it away. Um, and, and he felt he'd hit a wall, which is what, what you know, Delma felt at the start of the war as well. And so um, as I kept on traveling to Ukraine, I, I met many kind of civic psyops guys, which has become like a thing in Ukraine. That's you, have interesting. All these, yeah. you have all these kind of like guys from advertising and marketing who, since the war started, have thrown their efforts to using their skills. A lot of them were doing marketing to Russia before. Um, to try to get soldiers to desert, undermine mobilization, um, get people to be less willing to uh, go along with the various laws that, that the Kremlin is issuing. Not because they were looking for the good in Russians. No one's, this is not a sort of moral debate. This is about 
how do you create effective communication that undermines the other side? And they've been trying loads of things, uh, including some of the things that Delma tries in the book. Um, I mean, because the war's ongoing, you know, I think the full story, which I don't know, will have to be revealed after the war because a lot of this stuff is obviously done in, done in the murky space of communication. But they were doing very amusing things that they told me about, like putting ads on porn sites or on uh, sites uh, where you download pirate videos, because that's where Russian soldiers might go. And you do sort of pop-up ads, which take you in the end to, this is how you defect, this is how you surrender. Um, they were doing robocalls, so mass robocalls to Russians. Um, and the journey they went on was a similar one that Delma went on. At first, trying to make the moral argument, like talking about war crimes and do you know what's being done in your name? That didn't work. Mm -hmm. But then talking about, you know, the economic costs of the war uh, to them, which is something that Delma did too. Yeah, I, I really like your descriptions of, of sellers and, and kind of like the underground for, for desire. You have, you have several metaphors for this. I would say, but both for Russians and, and let's say the like people who are holding fast to myths rather than truth. And, and the actual seller, I mean, the actual sell sellers were resistance fighters were hiding in Ukraine at the, at the beginning of the war and, and hoping that they, would, that they would survive. So I, I mean, I found that really moving. Um, and, and especially in your story of Kharkiv, I, I covered Kharkiv quite well in my own work and, and lived there in 2019. Um, and I just remember the bravery of, of frontline journalists who were just there um, sending reports in the, in the middle of the night. So uh, to, to make this into kind of like the last question or questions for you, I want to ask a, a question about in information, information space, info warriors, and, and justice. So justice is, is really a, a word that because the war is ongoing, I, f I find in my own coverage, a lot of people have difficulty talking about. And, and when I begin these conversations, because there's something like 150,000 to 200,000 war crimes about the Nuremberg moment or a Nuremberg tribunal or a hybrid tribunal, what Ukrainians are really concerned about and how to make that happen, the conversations often get shut down. So wh what is it? that you see as, as the responsibility for, for people who have, who have subverted the propaganda machine, maybe even created their own counter propaganda. And, and for, those, for those, let's say Germans in the Third Reich or Russians under Putin, what, what kind of justice are you imagining toward the end of the story? That's a really hard question. Well, actually, it's, it's not because this is what most of my, what, the reason I'm going to Ukraine a lot of the time is, is for a project called The Reckoning Project, which is all about justice. What's, much, what's interesting now as opposed to the Second World War is the justice is happening already um, in that sense that we already have two ICC uh, indictments. Uh, I think they're called indictments. They're not, uh, are they quite indictments? Whatever, two ICC cases brought against Putin and his henchmen. Um, usually that happens after a war. So we have a revolutionary moment where justice is being processed during the war. And you can be cynical and say, oh, Putin will never stand trial. He already can't travel to a lot of places. So that justice has is also a political weapon. 123 countries. Yeah, exactly. Last and count. it's hugely embarrassing for him and a pain. And, and yes, it's not the glorious last judgment, but, but it is actually quite a useful tool. Um, again, actually, it's a form of... I'm sure the people who do it think about it purely in terms of justice, but it is a, a, a form of information activity as well, because you're sending a message to, you know, your boss is not above the law. You, mid-ranking bureaucrat, are also going to get it as well. Is it really worth working for him? Now, that's that's. I'm sure that's not how the ICC look at look at it at all. But that that factor is definitely there. Um, so, so in that sense, um, justice is much more in the middle of a war now, not after, as it was in Germany. What I'm fascinated by personally, and I'm working on currently, are kind of two factors. And I guess we'll have to talk about them in depth later, because they're not really in the book. Um, one is the criminal liability and responsibility of propagandists in war crimes. And I'm really interested in getting beyond incitement to genocide, because everybody fixates on this type of speech. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm interested in is connecting information operations to, to crimes. So if the propagandists know that their 
campaigns are aiding and abetting war crimes, like the bombardment of a maternity hospital, mm. what is their responsibility? What is their criminal responsibility? Um, in Nuremberg, the main propagandist who is Delmer's kind of rival during the war, Hans Fritscher, who's the head of the Nazi radio yeah. and the number one. People will have to read the book yeah. to talk about Fritscher, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but, but he's, he, he's the head of the Reich Radio. He's a very That's famous right. presenter. He's brought to Nuremberg. He's one of the one or two people who get off because mm. at the trial, he sort of says, I didn't know about the war crimes and I was just given words to read by Goebbels. And he gets away with it. And I really hope that today's Fritchers don't get away with it. Uh, later, it transpired that he was perfectly aware of what was going on, but they hadn't got it, that evidence in time for Nuremberg. Um, so their responsibility is, is something that I think will become uh, a focus of, of conversation. Well, we'll be working on this over the next year. That's great. And I think that's a, a really good place to end. So I'll end with a quick promotion uh, here for Peter Pomerantsev. He is the author of the book called How to Win an Information War, The Propagandist Who Outwitted Hitler. This is just out and published uh, in 2024. So congratulations to Peter on, on his book. And thanks so much for the audience to the audience for coming. Thank you.